when we look at some of the individuals involved in the Renaissance, uh, this clearly comes, a, comes across because now we're going to turn to some of the individual artists and people who were part of the Renaissance. And usually you be, we begin by talking about Francesco Petrarch, uh, who lived in the early 14th century as the father of the Renaissance, and Petrarch being followed by guys like uh, Leonardo Bruni and Leon Alberti. Uh, but I like to begin with Giovanni Boccaccio. And uh, Giovanni Boccaccio was a contemporary of Petrarch uh, who lived from 1313 to 1375. And Boccaccio was important when it comes to uh, the Renaissance. He was a illegitimate son of a Florentine merchant. Uh, early on in his life, he was sent off as apprentice, apprentice to a, a merchant. And eventually he ended up as, in Naples, where he was working in a local bank there. And in 1341, on the Saturday evening before Easter, uh, Giovanni Boccaccio went to church. And while he was in church, uh, he saw a woman by the name of Maria. And Maria was the daughter of of King Robert of Anjou, the king at the time there. And Boccaccio immediately fell in love with Maria. And even though she was married at the time, that didn't stop things back then. Uh, he fell in love with Maria. Eventually, they had an affair. Much later, they had this little falling out. But Maria proved to be this inspiration for Boccaccio. Uh, he wanted to glorify her in some way, give praise to her, uh, so Boccaccio began to write short stories. And uh, eventually he wrote 100 of these short stories, which were collected and published as the Decameron in 1353. These 100 stories, uh, told by seven women and three men who had uh, escaped the city of Florence because of the plague, were a pioneer in the Western, were pioneering in the Western world. They were told in the vernacular, in the Italian, they were the first major vernacular prose work in the West since Rome. Uh, they had no moral purpose whatsoever. There wasn't any hidden little stories to be told or models of behavior there. They were told purely for entertainment's sake. And they were dedicated to Maria. They weren't dedicated uh, to the church. They weren't dedicated to some higher spiritual concern, whatever. They were dedicated just purely because of this love affair. And this was something completely new in the West, this kind of idea you should write for a woman. Uh, Boccaccio, after he published the Decameron, eventually went on to uh, further studies of the ancients. He wrote a number of works. And also he began to collect ancient manuscripts, which was very much part of the whole Renaissance, was this attempt to put back into circulation anything that had been lost over the previous century. But Boccaccio, uh, you know, if you want a short-term definition of him, first major prose writer of the Renaissance, first to use the vernacular at the time. Kind of shifting gears a little bit, we'll shift northward. And my favorite of the entire Renaissance is a Frenchman by the name of Francois Rabelais. And Francois Rabelais lived from 1495 to 1553. Uh, there's very little known about his early years. Somehow, Francois ended up as a monk. And he first comes into notice around 1530 when he began to study medicine. Uh, at the same time he was studying medicine, he was an amateur actor, uh, he was an amateur chef, he kind of dabbled in a number of, of different pursuits. And while he was studying medicine, there appeared a work that was circulating in France at the time, and that work was called Gargantua and Pantagruel. And Gargantua and Pantagruel was a folk legend about giants who lived in France in the Middle Ages and all their deeds and everything that they had done. And when that appeared, Rabelais decided to use that as a basis of a larger work. And he wrote his own work called 
Gargantua and Pantagruel, the first book of which came out in 1533, and subsequent uh, editions came out later until his death. Um, the book itself is a great book. There's no question about it. It opens with the birth of Gargantua. He's the son of giants. He's a giant himself. He's huge. Uh, he's born during this great feast. All these people are eating and feasting and everything. And eventually he grows up. And one of the things he does is he establishes his own abbey. And in one of the all-time great paragraphs written, he sets out how that abbey was to be regulated and how it was to work. And he wrote, all their life was regulated not by laws, statutes, or rules, but according to their free will and pleasure. They rose from bed when they pleased and drank, drank, ate, worked, and slept when the fancy seized them. Nobody woke them, nobody compelled them either to eat or to drink or to do anything else whatsoever. So it was that Gargantua has established it. In their rules, there was only one clause. Do what you will, because people who are free, well-born, well-bred, and easy and honest company have a natural spur and instinct that drives them to virtuous deeds and deflects them from vice. This was how Gargantua was going to run his abbey. And in a way, it contains this little portion of insight uh, into humanity, the fact that when it is when you establish laws, when you create barriers saying, thou shalt not do this, that's when it becomes enticing, and that's when people actually do it. And Rabelais is uh, giving us this vision that we really don't possibly need those laws. Uh, but more directly, it was a vehement, satirical, open-faced attack on monasteries, on the church, for all these little regulations and everything they had about life, uh, taking the joy out of life, uh, so to speak. Uh, the book gets even, it gets even further afield. Uh, Gargantua has a son, Pantagruel, and Pantagruel has to be educated. And he sends him off to college. He goes through all these little uh, trials and tribulations of college life, much as the rest of us do. And while in college, Pantagruel makes friends with a guy by the name of Panurge. And Panurge is this riotous character. Uh, he takes part in all these episodes. And eventually, Panurge sees the light and decides, Maybe it's time for me to get married. Maybe it's time for me to settle down and, and, and uh, maybe produce some children or whatever. Uh, but Panurge really isn't sure that he should do this. And so Pantagruel and Panurge decide that they're going to uh, travel to see the oracle. And well, the oracle, referring back to the oracle at Delphi uh, in ancient Greece, and they're going to consult the oracle and they're going to ask the oracle, well, should I get married? Is this the right thing to do? Uh, so they take off on this journey. They have all these little misadventures along the way. They get to the oracle. They ask the oracle this question, and the oracle kind of burps and goes, Trink, Trink, uh, and the book ends there. The oracle has burped. The oracle has uttered out this magic word, Trink. Nobody has a faintest idea what this means. Uh, everybody's wondering what it means. The reader's left completely aghast, has no idea what it means. Gargantua and Pantagruel, crucial, the first instance of humor, comic in the West, really since the ancient Greeks, some of them wrote com comedies, uh, that had been lost for centuries and everything. And here's this guy now in the, in the Renaissance writing a humorous, uh, satirical, comical account of life, uh, telling you that it's important that you live life, that you enjoy yourself, that pleasure is what really matters in life, uh, not the ascetic view of life as propounded by the church. And he did all this in a very, very vulgar language. It's, it's, some of the vulgarity even comes across when you read it in a, in a modern English translation and everything. But there's all kinds of things which I can't tell you about on the air that really take place in the book. Very, very vulgar and everything. Uh, got, in, got him into a lot of trouble with the church, too. In addition, Gargantua and Pantagruel is also part 
of a larger Western literary tradition of the utopian image or the utopian novel, uh, the, no the idea of some sort of utopian future society where everything is nice and everything is fixed, and that would include guys like Plato and Sir Thomas More or George Orwell, uh, uh, Evgeny Zamyatin, all these utopian writers. Pen uh, Rob Lay was part of that and everything. Uh, but he was also fits right in with the Renaissance, uh, the value of the individual, the lauding of the individual life. In a little different vein, away from the humor of Rob Lay, was the Florentine Niccolò Machiavelli. Uh, Machiavelli, 1469 to 1527, probably the most famous political philosopher of all time. And Machiavelli himself grew up in Florence. Uh, for a short time, he worked in the, the diplomatic service of the city before being exiled in 1512. And after being exiled, Machiavelli sat down to write about his experiences, to write about his ideas of politics and how politics were played. Uh, more specifically, what Machiavelli had in mind when he began to write his most famous work, which was Il Principe, or The Prince, uh, was that Italy at that time was disunited. It was in fragments. Uh, there were different rulers in the north, the papal states in the center, Naples in the south. Uh, there was no real unifying bond to the peninsula anymore. And Machiavelli wrote The Prince as his prescription for putting Italy back together again, to reunify Italy so it would reachieve the greatness of ancient Rome. And so when he wrote down his prescriptions, he wrote about politics. And the foremost maxim of politics, as Machiavelli had seen it, was that politics had nothing to do with moral or ethical behavior. Politics had nothing to do with moral or ethical behavior. Uh, this is something that we've later come to call real politique, real politics or power politics. Politics is a struggle for power, a naked struggle for power. And the strong always survive that struggle. As such, the little maxim that comes to mind is that the ends justify the means. In politics, the ends justify the means. The state was a power. Anything whatsoever that kept the state strong was viable. And the reasoning behind this was that Machiavelli had a very pessimistic view of mankind or human nature. He thought that men were inherently evil, men were inherently nasty, Men were inherent, would inherently fight each other all the time. And as a result, there would be anarchy. There would be no order. Machiavelli believed that for an organized, stable political system to exist, the state had to control the evil urges of men. And as a result, you needed a powerful, strong ruler. So the state had to be strong. The ruler had to be strong. It was power that really mattered when it came to politics. To seize that power, to use that power, what the prince, what the ruler had to learn was, as Machiavelli put it, how not to be good. How not to be good. Because Machiavelli believed that all men were two-faced, that they were disarming, they would try and weasel your way, they would try and weasel their way into the prince's retinue and destroy him. So the prince had to be a fox. Uh, he had to be able to uh, find out these people and destroy them before they destroyed him. And he wrote this, these couple lines here. From this arises the question whether it is better to be loved than feared, or feared more than loved. The reply is that one ought to be both feared and loved. But as it is more difficult for the two to go together, it is much safer to be feared than loved. You know, forget the loving, forget the people adoring you, make them fear you, and that's what will be uh, the realm of political success for anybody. This was crucial. Before Machiavelli, 
politics in the Middle Ages had really been defined in terms of the church. Um, even secular rulers talked about being on the throne by the divine right of God. Everything came from God. Everything. It was a church that defined politics. The church said, thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not do that. Uh, Machiavelli cut through all that, eliminated the church as a political actor, eliminated Christianity uh, as a means of politics, and said, basically, politics are a struggle for power, a secular terms. And he described politics in words in, of candor. Uh, he described words, politics in words that were clear. And this, of course, got him into trouble. Everybody criticized Machiavelli. They still criticize Machiavelli as being immoral, as being unethical. And how could you say something like the ends justify the means? Does that mean that we can kill these million people or something because that will justify our rule or whatever? But what Machiavelli wasn't doing, what Machiavelli was doing was just describing politics. He wasn't justifying anything. And so, in that respect, uh, Machiavelli was very much part of the Renaissance in describing individual behavior of rulers, how individuals played the game of politics. Uh, a little bit different aspect to the whole uh, humanism of the Renaissance. Now, uh, there are certainly a lot of other individuals involved in the Renaissance, guys like Erasmus of Rotterdam, Marsilio Ficino, or Mirandola, but in many respects, the most important aspect of the Renaissance were the innovations taken in the field of art. Because a lot of what these guys wrote, these humanists wrote Erasmus or Petrarch and everything, we read it today, it's very dated, it means nothing for us. Uh, but if we look at the painting, the sculpture, the architect of the Renaissance, uh, it immediately strikes us, and that's what we remember, and that's what was really important, in a way, about the lasting effects of the Renaissance. In the Middle Ages, art was, first of all, dominated by the church. All art took place within the church, within the confines of the church. The church used that art for explicit moral and ethical reasons. If it used that art to explain biblical tales or biblical parables, whatever. It was there for a purpose, to uh, enlighten you in some way. As a result, because it was there for a purpose, there was very little attention given to uh, the forms of the art, the character, the drama of the art, the setting of the art. All that was secondary because the story was, was, was what was important. Uh, and so when you look at the art of the Middle Ages, it's flat, it's lifeless, it's two-dimensional. In a lot of respects, it looks like they just cut out a little picture of somebody and pasted him up on the wall, put a halo around him, and called him art. And in a way, that's what they did. Uh, but the Renaissance, Renaissance art was completely different because the Renaissance rediscovered humanity. The Renaissance rediscovered the human form. And that's what was important. Uh, and during the Renaissance, art now became more secular. It was freed from the control of the church. Though a lot of painting took place within the church, an equal amount of painting took place outside of the church. Now people painted prosperous merchants or businessmen and everything with no uh, moral or religious connections whatsoever. Uh, the Renaissance artists stressed the individual. They stressed the human form. They stressed the muscles on you, the facial expression, uh, the lifelike uh, individual is, was portrayed in the art. And they did this because the Renaissance rediscovered perspective, three-dimensional painting on a two-dimensional surface. There's perspective to Renaissance art, all centered on putting the man in some sort of perspective on the canvas. Renaissance art also was no longer subject to architecture. Before the Renaissance, everything... Painting, sculpture, 
always there as an addendum to the architectural structure. It was there to fill up a wall, it was there to provide a little statue there. But in the Renaissance now, painting, sculpture were freed from this dependence, this tie to architecture. And you painted portraits, you painted individual works that had nothing to do with the building, you sculpted statues that weren't there to adorn any building, it was completely different. The other big breakthrough for the Renaissance was oil paints. Oil paints would ha which had been developed in Holland enabled Renaissance artists to experiment a lot more with different techniques, uh, to try different composition styles and everything. And this was something that the Middle Ages did not have. Uh, the other thing that differed uh, about the Renaissance was in the Renaissance there was something called uh, chiaroscuro. And this is an Italian word that means roughly light, dark. We could also transi translate it as contrast. Uh, there was the contrast between the characters in the painting in the background. Uh, all this, the contrast of colors and everything now became important, which was not the case with the Middle Ages. And all this, all this, this these innovations in the field of art led to the point where artists now became important in the West. Uh, before the Renaissance, artists in a lot of cases were no more than skilled craftsmen. They didn't have names, they didn't have reputations, they, they rarely got uh, paid very much. But in the Renaissance now, artists were in demand. And individuals like da Vinci, Raphael, Michelangelo, in a way were more powerful than any pope or any prince at the time. It was their reputation. They were, people really wanted them. And so they could actually, you know, in a way, order secular rulers or papal rulers about. And this was unprecedented. Really, I don't know if even the Greeks and Romans, uh, under them, that the status and prestige of artists was as great as it was during the Renaissance. Uh, usually, when we talk about Renaissance art, uh, we begin with a, a painter by the name of Giotto, who lived roughly turn of the 14th century, early 1300s. Uh, but there was a large gap from Giotto to uh, successors. Uh, some of the people who eventually followed him were Donatello, uh, the sculptor, and Botticelli, another painter. But really, Renaissance art centered on the work of three individuals. Again, the word individuals. Uh, the first of this big three, as I call them, was Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci, uh, 1452 to 1519, has been labeled the typical universal man, a Renaissance man, because he dabbled in just about everything that there was. Engineering, drawing, sculpting, painting, architecture. Uh, he, did, he did so many different things one of his problems was he never finished most of the things that he began. He left all these uh, unfinished works. But he was a pioneer in the study of anatomy. And he studied the anatomy, and then he applied that to his paintings. Uh, he dug up all these corpses and dissected them. He used to rob the graves at night. But dug up all these corpses, looked at their muscles, looked at their structure and everything. And then when he painted, he tried to duplicate that. And... This was pioneering, and this is something that, uh, in a way, he influenced a lot of uh, succeeding artists, was this anatomical correctness of his works, his, his concern with the human form and its, its vision. And he's painted a number of, of things that, that have survived, the most famous of which is The Last Supper, which was painted in Milan, which was a fresco on the wall. I painted Mona Lisa, Virgin of the Rocks, etc., all these paintings, in addition to this anatomical aspect, also used a technique that the um, Italians called sfumato. And sfumato, is some, we would say, is haziness or smokiness. All the outlines of the individuals on Leonardo's paintings have this smoky haze around them, this vagueness, so to speak. And this was... Da Vinci's way of contrasting the, that individual with his background, with the natural setting in which he was painting and everything. Uh, it kind of softened that, but at the same time brought out the difference between that 
uh, character and the background. Uh, if anything I was to say about Da Vinci, and actually since we're in D.C. here, there's one painting by Da Vinci down in the National Gallery, the only painting in the Western world, the Western Hemisphere, if you ever want to see what he painted. I mean, but Da Vinci, above all, this c concern for the a anatomy of his subjects uh, was what was really lasting that he did. The second of the big three was Raphael. Raphael Santi uh, lived from 1483 to 1520. Raphael died at a very early age as a result of excesses of pleasure, which he suffered one hot day in the year 1520. Uh, after his death, Raphael was buried in the Pantheon. And it's kind of symbolic here because the Pantheon was the Roman temple, the main temple in the city of Rome with all the, the, the niches for the gods and everything. Raphael chose to be buried in the former center of Roman paganism. Sin really very much symbolized the synthesis between antiquity and Christianity, which culminated in the Renaissance. Uh, Raphael uh, was a, a painter of brilliance. Uh, he painted a number of very, of very popular Madonnas, but he's also responsible for painting the ceilings in the Vatican Library. And one of the great contrasts in the Vatican Library, on one wall he painted the Disputa, and he painted theologians, middle-aged Christian theologians at work disputing uh, some sort of proposition. And on the opposing wall of the Vatican Library, Raphael painted the School of Athens. Ancient Greek philosophers at work uh, discussing some philosophical topics. In one room of the Vatican, then, Raphael summed up kind of what the Renaissance was doing, taking the opposing faces of Western Christianity and early Greek rational thought and counterposing them together in some sort of large um, synthesis in a way. Uh, that's really what Raphael was attempting to get across in his paintings. The third of the big three uh, was Michelangelo. Uh, Michelangelo, who lived from 1475 to 1564, was probably the greatest sculptor of all time probably one of the greatest painters of all time, probably one of the greatest architects of all time. Again, this versatility, which was very much evident in Da Vinci. Michelangelo, in 1501, sculpted David, a figure of David, a freestanding sculpture of David, which he did for the city of Florence. Uh, the first as the textbook calls it, the first monumental freestanding nude male in the Western world since antiquity. Uh, but the concern for not only the, the human form evident in David, but also for the psychological drama. And you look closely at the sculpture, you see this little knitted brow. Is, is David really, what's he worried about here? What's concerning him as he tries to take the slingshot from his, his shoulder and everything? And Michelangelo was very much a master of that, the, getting at that psychological torment within his subject. Uh, he also did that with his statue of Moses. Uh, he did that with his statues on the tomb of the Medici. Uh, and he did that in his Pieta, uh, the Virgin Mother holding the Christ after he's come from the cross, uh, which for some reason people are always trying to blow up, very much show that psychological insight at uh, which Michelangelo was trying to get across. His last work before he died uh, was the Pietà Rondinini, the unfinished Pietà, the unfinished version of uh, the Virgin Mary holding uh, Christ. And actually Michelangelo has a lot of unfinished works. And this was kind of symbolic, not only of his life, but what he was trying to get at, that uh, there are some sort of different quality uh, to humanity, that humanity isn't always a polished, uh, uh, beautified version, that there's sometimes some other little dark features there within him, which shows had really gone beyond the Renaissance. He had gone beyond that optimism and everything that went along with the Renaissance, the 
uh, the beauty of man, and actually had begun start to start exploring the dark side, so to speak, of man. Uh, eventually, the whole Renaissance period came to an end. Uh, it came to an end because of war. Uh, from roughly the late 1490s until the 1540s, uh, the Italian peninsula was rocked by continuous war between the Italian Spaniards, uh, the Italian cities themselves, trying to defend themselves. And this long-term war took its toll on the vitality of the period. Uh, at the same time, the discovery of the New World, the voyages of discovery by Spain, Portugal, Holland, and England, led to a shifting away of commerce and trade from the Mediterranean to the Atlantic seacoast. And that shifting away, then all the wealth of Italy moved from moved up to the Atlantic coast, moved out of Italy. And as a result, the kind of Renaissance moved that way too. And the other thing that ended it was the counter-reformation of the church. Uh, the attempt by the church to uh, re-solidify itself, get back in control of doctrine and everything. And as a result, you had such things as the church hiring an artist to put clothes on all the figures of Michelangelo that Michelangelo had drawn in the Sistine Chapel and everything. You had the church trying to cover up all these things. And when the church put its foot down, a lot of the artistic creativity and everything also went down too. As a result, eventually the, the Renaissance came to an end. Uh, a couple last things I'd like you to remember about the Renaissance is that, first of all, this fire here, uh, first of all, the Renaissance, above all, was a movement of the elite. In terms of percentages, maybe at the most 10% of the population of Europe at any time was at any bit concerned with what was going on with regard to the Renaissance. The rest of the 90% or 80% of the European population, little peasants were mired in the mud and they could care less what was going on about who was painting this or carving this out of a rock. So it was a movement of the elite, much like every other intellectual and artistic movement in the Western world from the very beginning. All, we're always talking about the elite, the 5 to 10% of people at the top. Uh, as a result, one of the weird things that came out of the Renaissance was the cult of the gentleman, gentlemanly behavior, proper behavior, and everything. Uh, the other thing that I want you to remember about the Renaissance was that it was crucial in leading into the modern ethic, the modern worldview. And in that respect, when humanists returned to the values of the ancient world, they returned to those values through a thousand years of Christianity. So you just didn't go back to ancient Greece. You went back to ancient Greece, but you went back through Christianity. As a result, the humanists produced a synthesis of ancient values and Christian values. And that synthesis is the basis of the modern West. And in part two of the course, that's where we we'll begin where I talk at some length about what that synthesis really is and what those values really are. Uh, 